Oh, I forgot to make the announcement of Slack, so I will do it now. To write what? To, to make the announcement uh, reminding the, the Slack uh, for discussions. Then, then you have to check Slack. One more thing you have to check. But it's also for the participants to make social mm -hmm. contact. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so we're going to start now uh, with Rogerio, but before that, uh, let me remind you that there is a um, Slack channel. You can find the links on the, on the ICDP website uh, of, the, of, the, of the school. So the Slack, if you're not familiar, is like a forum. It's a mixture between email, WhatsApp, and so on. It allows to have uh, discussions with the rest of the participants. I see, I see there are many users, many of you already connect, so there are 200 users. So what I want to remind you is that Andrea uh, asked us um, that if you have questions uh, about the homework or you want to have further discussions about them, there is a good place to, to have them. So feel free to, to ask there the questions to any of the lecturers, to Rogerio and Ricardo as well. And it can be useful that when you are talking to some of the lecturers, you hashtag them by putting the at and the name of the lecturer. So in this way, uh, that, that lecturer will see the, the question. Okay, so that said, now we will start with the, the we're very happy to start with the, with the fourth lecture by Rogerio, so whenever you want. Okay, John, thank you very much. So hello, everyone. Um, I'm afraid that uh, these lectures now will enter an exponential accelerated phase <laughs> because I have too much material, but let's see how it goes. I don't want to speed up too much. Actually. So uh, last time, yesterday, we were talking about uh, the thermal history of the universe. And it so happens in the thermal history of the universe, as uh, the universe is very hot and dense, Particles interact, uh, they exchange momentum, they can exchange also uh, their identities. Now, it can turn into one another, like electron, positron turning to photon, vice versa. So they're, they're in a state of thermal equilibrium. And as the universe cools down, um, this uh, interaction rate is not enough to keep the, the uh, two different uh, particles, for instance, in thermal equilibrium, and they drop out and they decouple. That's the uh, term that we use. So uh, yesterday, we uh, uh, pointed out that there are two rates that have to compare. One is the rate of interactions, and this is this single gamma here, and the rate of expansion of the universe, uh, which is double as a function of, of, of time or temperature, et cetera. And, and when these rates are uh, similar, uh, so when, when the interaction rate is much larger than the expansion rate of the universe, the particles are in thermal equilibrium. And a very simple estimate of when particles decouple is when these two rates become comparable. You can see next week with the lectures of Francesco that uh, you need to solve Boltzmann equation to find this out. But this is not what we're going to do now. And I give an example of the decouple, decoupling of neutrinos from the thermal bed. Neutrinos are in thermal equilibrium with electrons, for instance, and positrons because of the weak interactions. The weak interactions are characterized at low energies by a cross section given by the uh, uh, Fermi uh, constant is squared. And then to make the cross section to, to have the right dimensions, it has to be multiplied by uh, energy squared. And the only uh, energy in the game is temperature. So, it was, uh, so the cross section goes like the yeah, squared T squared. And we saw already that the number density of neutrinos goes like the cube. So the uh, interaction rate goes like to the fifth power. Whereas we already saw also that the Hubble uh, um, uh, Parameter goes like t square over main Planck. So if you equate these two, you get that the uh, neutrinos decouple in the early universe when the, when the temperature was around uh, a M MeV, a million electrons. So after the coupling, the neutrinos uh, they cool down as one over the scale factor there, um, uh, we saw already. And I, I make some uh, observations now about the neutrinos. We have more to say about neutrinos probably later. So the neutrinos, in principle, they would have the same temperature as the photons. But there's something that happens after neutrino decouples. 
The twin couples at uh, the universe was one uh, MeV. The, te the temperature was one MeV. And as the uh, temperature decreases even further, what happens is that the electron positron um, soup in the universe also starts to disappear because the electrons and positrons become non relativistic at a temperature around the, their mass, which is around 0.5 MeV, and then they annihilate into photons. And when the electron positrons annihilate into photons, they, uh, uh, they heat the photon gas a little bit. Um, so that's, that's why uh, the neutrinos are a bit cooler than photons today. So the, uh, the neutrino temperature today is around uh, 1.9 uh, Kelvin, whereas the photon doesn't know it's 2.7. So I want to make some uh, comments of observations about neutrinos. So as with the photons, we expect to have a cosmic neutrino background at very, large, uh, very small temperatures, so very, very low energy neutrinos, and this is very difficult to detect. So it has not been detected yet, very challenging, and there's an experiment called Ptolemy that's been designed for this search. It's not started yet, but has been planning stage as far as I know. So this is uh, something that uh, we expect to be uh, here. Another observation is that in the standard model, uh, neutrinos are massless, and, and only the uh, left-handed component of neutrino exists. There's some extension of the standard model that Andrea uh, mentioned that uh, postulates the existence of a uh, right-handed neutrino, and these are mostly motivated to explain neutrino masses. So in this case, there's a new degree of freedom, uh, and as you uh, heard from Andrea, uh, this new degree of freedom, the right-handed neutrino is a gauge singlet uh, under standard model interactions, and that's what we call a sterile neutrino. These states, because they're gauge singlet, they don't interact uh, to the, uh, so they only interact gravitationally. <laughs> so the interaction rate is extremely small. So they, they were never in equilibrium. And that some, they're usually very heavy, but some models are not so heavy. And in fact, uh, there are models where these uh, sterile neutrinos can be uh, used as a, a type of dark matter called warm dark matter. Now, uh, a third observation that I want to make about the neutrinos in the universe is the following. I want to uh, very uh, quickly derive for you, for you a bound on the uh, neutrino masses. So this, this was one of the first bounds on the neutrino masses that came from cosmology. And then this was, if I remember correctly, uh, in the 1970s or 80s, and it's called the Lee Weinberg bound. So if neutrinos are around, uh, their number density, is, uh, uh, they are around, their number density uh, is, uh, is not very different from the number density of photons. You can compute the number density, that's what I did here very quickly, and I'm sorry I'm not going to all the details here. Uh, first, I want, to, uh, uh, I want to point out that the temperature of the neutrinos, you can compute that, is related to the temperature of photons because of this factor here. And this comes about because of electron uh, positron annihilation and entropy conservation. So um, you can easily compute, uh, given the number of photons, which you probably computed in one of the exercises, you can compute the number of neutrinos. So there are around 100 uh, neutrinos per cubic centimeter. So those are neutrinos that are left over from the Big Bang and that are around us, and that's their number density in the whole universe. So if neutrinos have a mass, and this, uh, this, this sea of neutrinos contribute to the density of the universe, the energy density of the universe. And that's the uh, uh, Lee Weinberg bound. You can compute what is the contribution uh, of neutrinos to the, to, the, you know, to the fraction of energy density of the universe. And, and uh, neutrinos uh, uh, assume that they're non relativistic today. So energy density is just the mass of the neutrinos times the uh, number density of neutrinos. And if you compute this very easily using these relations that I put in here, what you find is that uh, the contribution of uh, neutrinos to the uh, universe, to the energy density of the universe, corresponds to uh, the sum of neutrino masses over 90 electron volts. So that means that if the sum of neutrino masses was around 90 electron volts, it would contribute to omega equals one. <laughs> That's not what we observe. So, um, so this, is, this was one of the uh, first uh, bounds on neutrino masses that came from cosmology. And this is for neutrinos not to overclose the universe. Just because, again, they're around, they have this number density, 115 per cubic centimeter. If they have a mass, we contribute, of course, to the uh, energy density of the universe. Now, the most stringent bounds on neutrino masses comes from cosmology, but not, uh, not from this argument. 
some structure formation, and I hope to get to that uh, later on. And, and also, I want to comment about something called the ineffective number of effective degrees of freedom in thermal equilibrium uh, around, the, uh, around CMB, around cosmic microwave background time. And because this, this is an important parameter uh, when people are discussing physics uh, beyond standard. So uh, experiments such as the Planck satellite, for instance, that are measuring uh, photons from the CMB, they are sensitive to the number of relativistic degrees of freedom that are present at the time where CMB was produced. And we are going to talk about which time is that. So, and this number of degrees of freedom, uh, relativistic degrees of freedom, they are characterized by this uh, ineffective parameter. So the ineffective parameter is a way to parameterize relativistic degrees of freedom at the time of the uh, cosmic microwave uh, background production. So at that time, there's only, uh, 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 the only thing that's relativistic or can be relativistic are, um, um, photons and neutrinos, and this ineffective is normalized. This normalization here has to do with the difference between so normalized to be uh, what would be the contribution of one neutrino. Um, so the contribution of one neutrino is just this factor here, and seven eighths is the difference between the Bose Einstein and the Fermi Dirac statistics, and this four eleven to the four thirds is the difference in the background temperature of neutrinos and photons. Standard model, this should be a Three is actually 3.46 because of some details that the trees are a little bit heated also um, by electron positron annihilation, but it's pretty much three. So um, and there were some measurements, uh, early measurements of the cosmic microwave background indicating that uh, an effect was larger than three. Uh, and this prompted many papers that were postulating new relativistic degrees of freedom around uh, the CMB time. And this, uh, just to make things more confusing, people gave the name of this new relativistic degrees of freedom at around the SMB time of dark radiation. It's a terrible name, but that, that's what was given. Um, now, in 2018, so those are the latest, latest Planck results. Uh, the, the measure value of an effect it was uh, very consistent with uh, the standard model within errors. So most people are now happy. However, I have to say that, uh, and I'll show why, uh, this uh, possibility of having a, uh, a larger number of uh, 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 relativistic degrees of freedom around the CMB epoch is coming back. The, the whole idea, there's a motivation for that, which I'm going to discuss shortly. So I also want to discuss uh, the decoupling of matter radiation using the same, uh, more or less the same tools that we have uh, developed so far. Um, and this has to do, of course, with the uh, fact that uh, at very large temperatures, um, um, the atoms uh, are not there yet, they're not formed yet. So uh, the, the radiation is tightly coupled to the plasma of electrons and photons. So the decoupling of radiation, of matter radiation, occurs when the universe cools down, and uh, finally, hydrogen, for instance, which is the most common element in the universe, both electrons can be formed. So if I ask you, what is the temperature of the universe when, this, uh, when uh, the hydrogen atom can form, the naive answer you would uh, probably give to me that this temperature is 13.6 electron volts because that's the binding energy of an hydrogen atom. So if the energy of the, energy of the universe is larger than 13.6 electron volts, there will be no hydrogen atoms, but they'll be all ionized. Well, this, this is a good guess, but this is not correct. And it's not correct because there are many, many more photons than there are uh, uh, protons and electrons in the universe. So you have to take into account that there's a whole uh, distribution of energy of photons for a given temperature. Uh, so uh, the temperature actually determines the um, uh, distribution of uh, energy of photons, right? Um, so you have to take into account that there are many, many more photons than uh, uh, protons in the universe. So, uh, and so we are actually going to find a uh, low temperature that uh, there is a decoupling for, uh, for this reaction here, photon that uh, interacts with uh, hydrogen and ionizes it into electrons. The way I'm going to do this in a very simple way, I'm just going to integrate out the, uh, the distribution, the energy distribution of the photons for a given value. Uh, uh, that has energy larger than 13.6 electron volts and equate that to the number of protons. 
And that, that's how I'm going to derive uh, the temperature in which the coupling of magnetization occurs. Correct treatment, of course, is to solve the Boltzmann equation. So uh, as I mentioned, I will use a much simpler uh, argument, physical estimate. I will simply find the temperature to which the number density of photons with energy larger than the hydro, uh, hydrogen ionization energy equals the number density of protons. So in equations, uh, this is the number density of photons with energy larger than the ionization energy uh, of, uh, of the hydrogen as a function of the redshift z equals the number of protons uh, as a, also a function. So I'm going to find a redshift when this thing, uh, when this equality happens. So you, you understand that uh, you have to integrate over this uh, distribution of, uh, of photons, which I, I gave to you last uh, yesterday. And using the fact that the uh, temperature is a function of redshift goes like one plus Z. That's also, so one, the temperature goes down as one over A. And remember that one over A scale factor is one plus Z. And also remember that the number density of protons is like the number density of protons today. And it, it gets diluted uh, as, as time goes by, or uh, it gets increased as you go back in time, the factor of one plus z uh, to the third power. So I want to find the redshift at which uh, these two things are equal. So I just have to solve this equation here. Uh, and this is, you have to do it numerically. So I did it in Mathematica, and this is uh, right, uh, the number uh, days of protons today as uh, one of the mass uh, of the proton mass times the, uh, the density, the, uh, the energy density in protons, which is basically the critical density times omega baryons. Critical density is this. So I just put everything in mathematics using omega p equals 0 0.048. And I, just to show you that it's not difficult to do, right? And, and so you, you want to find, uh, um, and this variable here, I, I, I made the transformation variable. So this x, xi here is just the ionization temperature divided by the decoupling temperature. And just by uh, equating this, Mathematica gave me this uh, root for this equation, um, which is actually, so that tells me that the decoupling temperature is 13.6 divided by 29. And that's uh, point, around 0.5 electron. So this was a very uh, simple argument. But the correct result uh, is a little bit different, so factor also factor two different. The correct result is that the decoupling of uh, radiation from matter occurs at uh, 0.26 electron volts. So it's not 13.6 electron volts, it's uh, almost a factor of 50 here. And this, uh, you can transform electron volts to Kelvin. So that happens when the universe, the temperature of the universe was uh, three th around 3000 Kelvin. And I'll also, I'll also compute the uh, uh, redshift when this decoupling occurred, which is just the ratio of the temperature of the coupling to the temperature of the photons today. So remember that the temperature of the photons today is 2.7 Kelvin. The temperature of the coupling is 3,000 Kelvin. And this, is, this gives you a coupling redshift of uh, 1,100. After the coupling, the universe is neutral and becomes transparent to radiation, to photons. And this is what we call the last scattering surface because photons do not scatter anymore uh, after uh, atoms are formed and they just propagate freely. Um, so this is the picture here. And, uh, and this is a picture to show that what we're seeing today uh, in terms of the uh, radiation that comes, we call the cosmic microwave background, is the radiation that was generated uh, uh, in this last scattering surface. Because after the last scattering first surface, the photons basically don't scatter anymore. Okay, so we say that the uh, photons of the, uh, the uh, cosmic microwave background are generated when the universe had a redshift of 1100 and the temperature was around uh, 2000 Kelvin. You can also uh, estimate the age of the universe was around 380,000 years. So, any questions about this? about the decoupling of uh, photons and, and uh, matter. There's a question. No uh, questions? Th there is a question. In the chat, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, OK. 
Can you read? Uh, I don't yes. see that. So it says, uh, does an, an effective refer to the effective number of neutrino families? Sorry, what's the question again? The question is if an effective refers only to the uh, number of neutrino families. That's very good. Okay, so the n effective here, parametrizes, uh, uh, is related, is, parametrizes number of degrees of freedom uh, that are in terms of relativistic degrees of freedom that participates in the expansion of the universe at around the CMB era. So this is normalized to be uh, um, to, to one neutrino family. Okay. So that's what, so uh, that's why uh, an effective here, since we know there are three neutrino families, is around three. Not exactly three, but uh, because of some details, but uh, it's basically the number of neutrinos, uh, neutrino families that are relativistic at the time of CMB. So that's what I wrote here that in the standard model, this is the prediction of the standard model, that the ineffective uh, is 3.046. That's the prediction. Now, there are models beyond the standard model. There are extra relativistic degrees of freedom. There could be, right? Uh, in, in this uh, models beyond the standard model. And then uh, this would change this value of 3.046 to something bigger. And, uh, and this, this was uh, the name that was done to this neurotistic neutrino was dark radiation. But in the standard model, that's the question, it's only from neutrinos and that's the value uh, that you should measure and that's the value that Planck measure. But then I have to uh, I tell you some more about how Planck measure this. More questions? There's a new question. No. Uh, which says, are light spiral neutrinos included in an effective? Included? In an effective. Ah, yes. Good, good question. So this is um, my observation here. That uh, uh, this, uh, first of all, this uh, you know, sterile neutrinos, uh, they ne were never in thermal equilibrium. So we don't know exactly what their abundance is. And moreover, it's usually uh, they're uh, heavy. So they, uh, their abundance is completely negligible. And they, I mean, they're not uh, relativistic, I'm sorry. They're not relativistic, so they don't enter uh, in an effective. Thank you. Okay, cool. There are no more questions. So okay. If you wanna continue. All right. Uh, so I was talking about the coupling here and uh, how Planck measures. So the satellite Planck was measuring uh, the photons uh, uh, that comes from the last scattering surface. So I want to go back to something I mentioned in my first lecture, which is this Hubble tension. Or some people even call it crisis now, because uh, there is a, a, a large discrepancy of the order of five sigma, five to six sigmas, between the measurement of the Hubble constant uh, from um, Planck, let's say, so this is the top value here, and from supernova, something like this. Okay. So um, there is a there is a tension here, and this may be the first um, hint of new physics beyond the uh, lambda CDM or even beyond the standard model, if you want. So how can we explain that? Right? How can we explain that? So first I want to um, point out that the measurement of the Hubble constant, supernova, type 1a, is a direct measurement. It's basically Hubble's law, as we saw yesterday. So you measure the luminosity distance, you measure the redshift, and that gives you directly the Hubble constant. So there is no, there's, the only issue here is some systematic effects because uh, it's different, it's difficult to measure this, right? To make supernova uh, a standard candle is difficult. You have to calibrate the distance using something called the CFAD stars that have uh, a known period luminosity uh, relation. This was used since this, this type of stars, they are variable stars that were used since the time of Hubble to find the uh, distances to very uh, nearby galaxies. Okay, so there could be some systematic effects, but most people believe that the systematic effects are under control. So the question is, how does um, Planck measure H0? Ah, yes, yeah, so far. This is a beautiful plot. Uh, uh, talk about Hubble law. 
this is the distance ladder uh, from uh, Cephades to, to type 1a supernova. And, uh, and this is at a little bit higher redshift. And uh, this is in a paper by Adam Rees et al. So if you remember, Rees was one of the um, people that got the Nobel Prize for the discovery of the acceleration of the universe due to supernovas. And uh, now his quest is to measure H0. And his paper here, uh, this paper of 2016, is that, and the title is this, a 2.4% determination of the local volume of the system. And this plot just showed, shows the beautiful consistency of the Hubble one. So this is the plot. This is the type of data, the quality of data that is used in order to find uh, the Hubble constant. So it's important to have the calibration here of uh, Cephades uh, to, to distances. And this is called the distance ladder because uh, you have to calibrate here and then use supernovas here to measure the distance. Beautiful. Now, the CMB does not measure H0 directly. It's a result of a complicated fit of the model, lambda CDM, to the CMB, to the uh, cosmic microwave background angular power spectrum. Uh, and this has several parameters. The minimum number of parameters, I think, is six or seven. So um, it's not direct. So uh, I just want to give you a, a rough idea of uh, how they measure that. So the quantity that the uh, cosmic microwave background really measures is the angular scale uh, uh, defined by the physics of the decoupling. And this angular scale is called the theta star. And if I'm calling theta star here. So this is an angular scale, which is related to the physical scale uh, that sets up during the top. So as I mentioned before, uh, the cosmic microwave background is a standard ruler in the sky. But what is the physical scale CMB? So this is something I didn't mention before, but the physical scale of the cosmic microwave background is something that and calculate easily is called the sound horizon at the coupling. Sound horizon because it, uh, uh, it's the propagation of perturbations that is important. And so it's not the uh, speed of light that enters, it's the speed of sound. So the sound horizon at the coupling is just given by this familiar spread. It should be familiar to you at that point. So this is the speed of sound of perturbations. And this is the integral of uh, uh, the decoupling uh, redshift, the coupling of uh, matter and radiation, which we just computed 1100 to infinity. And this speed of sound is uh, for relativistic fluids, it's one, one over square root. So this scale here, theta star, is given as a ratio. Remember, this is the, uh, uh, the definition of the angular distance that we just saw maybe yesterday or two days ago. I don't even remember. And, and this scale, the angular scale, then is the uh, ratio of this uh, uh, angular, sorry, this uh, um, uh, sound horizon at the coupling divided by the angular distance to the decoupling surface, okay? This is the decoupling. So, uh, in and the angular distance, you're making an integral from today until the decoupling surface. So it's dominated by things around today, which we call late times. Whereas the uh, sound horizon at the coupling is the, uh, the time it took sound to propagate from the beginning of the universe is equals infinity to the decoupling uh, surface. So this is uh, what we call late times. This is what I would call early times. And you have to recall that in a flat lambda CDM model, the Hubble parameter is just, this is just a, a Friedman's equation, if you want, given by this uh, relation here. So that's how they measure H, right? Remember that enters here in the uh, Hubble, uh, sorry, the sound horizon. So if there is an extra contribution respect to the lambda CDM model to the Hubble parameter around the recombination era, and we want to keep our S fixed because this theta star is what is measured. So we want to, ma we want to keep our everything here fixed, our duration is fixed. But suppose we don't want to mess, to mess around with late time physics, but we can mess around with early time physics. And if we change the number of degrees of freedom that enters, uh, relativistic degrees of freedom that enters here around, say, the CMB, suppose there are more uh, relativistic degrees of freedom. So this thing is bigger uh, than it should be in the, uh, um, in the uh, um, lambda CDM. 
What does that mean? It means that uh, at age zero, as you fit, we have a smaller value, right? Because this is bigger and you want to keep it a star constant, you want to be RS uh, unchanged. So this would result in a smaller value of H0 in the, in the fit. So that's, that's, the main, that's the only thing there is to it. So if there is an extra contribution respect to the CDM model around the recombination area, in order to keep this sound horizon fixed, uh, this will uh, imply a lower value of H0, which is what is observed. I mean, the CMB fit is a smaller value of H0 as compared to local you know, supernova data. There are two ways of changing things, or two ways, there are many ways. One way is uh, to use something called early dark energy. I don't know if you remember, but dark energy is completely negligible in the past, but we don't know much about dark energy. So it's possible to build up models, to build models where dark energy has some role in the past. This has been done. There are some decaying dark matter that can decay to radiation around the CMB era. So there are many, many papers. Um, if you look in the uh, archives, you'll see many papers about trying to solve the, uh, uh, the Hubble tension. And, uh, and that's a very current, very uh, active field at this moment. They want to finish this um, with an example. And this example, I took it from today, uh, today's uh, listing of the archives. This is a paper, uh, first of all, I find it funny that uh, you put in the comments that it's unrelated to xenon one ton excess. <laughs> I find this funny. So it's dark radiation. I just told you what are dark radiation uh, from inflationary fluctuations. So I just want to say here, I hope that the, uh, at the end of this course, you will be able to understand a little bit of the, at least the part of the uh, summary. But the summary is that, uh, you know, uh, uh, he's proposing some uh, extra, some physics beyond the standard model, some light new vector bosons that can be produced in inflation. And they can decay into neutrinos. And if they can decay, decay into neutrinos, they will, they will inject more neutrinos. And uh, in this case, uh, 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 they will increase uh, the number of effective degradation just because there's more uh, neutrinos than uh, what we would expect in the standard model. And, uh, and it has to be around uh, CMB era because you don't want to affect uh, nuclear synthesis, big bang nuclear synthesis, which is something we're going to see uh, next. So this is just an example. Uh, as I said, there are many, many papers about uh, trying to solve the uh, Hubble tension. And, uh, uh, and this is just uh, uh, one of these papers. I, mean, I don't think he mentions Hubble tension in the abstract. No, he mentions, yes, Hubble tension here in the abstract. <laughs> okay. um, Rosario, there's yes. a question yes. from Gabriel. So he asks, from the Hubble tension, is it possible to determine in which epoch of the universe should new effects be relevant? Um, well, in principle, as I said, no, you can you can have uh, what's called late time solutions or early time solutions. So changing RS or changing the angular distance. And, uh, um, but most solutions are related to um, uh, early times, and, but cannot be very early because of what's, what I'm going to explain next. Big Bang nuclear synthesis, so you don't want to mess around uh, with Big Bang nuclear synthesis. So it has, it has to be some new physics that happens uh, around the CMB era. That's what most people are proposing. And most papers that we're going to see uh, have uh, solutions of this type, okay? Of changing physics with some extra degree, relativistic degrees of freedom at around, uh, at around and the CMB uh, time, not the decoupling time. And the reason is exactly this. You know, if you put more degrees of freedom here, if you increase this, the things that are in the square root, you have to decrease age naught in order to maintain the sound horizon decoupling uh, constant. Are there more questions, John? No, that's it. OK, good. So now I'm going to my second stack of lectures. Finally, so in this uh, second uh, part of the lectures, I want to talk about some origins. And there are lots of things about here in these lectures about dark matter origins, which I'm not going to discuss, because uh, you will see that in detail next week with Francesco. So what I plan to talk about is uh, the origin of light elements, the origin of baryons. I will skip section three. 
section four, we pretty much talked already. And then um, section five, which is uh, the origin of inhomogeneity in the universe. Because up to this point, we were just talking about the homogeneity. Okay. So let me start talking about the origin of light elements. Uh, this goes under the name of Big Bang Nucleosynthesis. Uh, people call it BBN for short. It's one of the pillars of the standard cosmological model. And you can see a nice review. I gave a reference here for a nice review. It's, uh, uh, it's the earliest cosmological probe we have so far. So it's the earliest test that we have uh, from the universe, okay? It tests, uh, it tests physics uh, uh, in the universe at the scale when the universe was a few, uh, few hundred seconds old. And the idea goes back to uh, George Gamow and his students in late 1940s. And the idea was simple. The idea was that the universe was very hot and very dense in the beginning. So you can have nuclear reactions and nuclear reactions can produce uh, heavier elements. Actually, George Gamow thought that uh, you could produce all the way to uranium, but uh, shortly afterwards, uh, people realized that was not possible because of uh, a bottleneck in the, uh, in the binding energy of uh, nuclear. Anyway, so the details of the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. So Big Bang nucleosynthesis, again, is the formation of light elements. And uh, by light elements, I mean uh, deuterium, helium, uh, and lithium and stops there, okay, <laughs> up to lithium. Um, so the details of the of big bang nucleosynthesis, sorry, involves, uh, to, if you want to do it correctly, involves a complicated set of nuclear reactions that you have to take into account. And, uh, and there are sophisticated uh, uh, computer codes that computes uh, uh, abundances. But I want to present a very simplified picture of big bang nucleosynthesis just to give you a flavor of the physics that is behind big bang nucleosynthesis. So I do big bang nucleosynthesis in four easy uh, steps. And uh, sorry. So, um, the first, uh, the first era of the universe I wanted to focus is when the universe was uh, hotter than one MeV. That is when the temperature, when the time uh, uh, much smaller than one second. So that's the age of the universe. So at that time around the MeV or larger, the universe was made out of neutrons, photons, electrons, neutrinos, sorry, this should be a neutrino, and photons. And, and uh, at this temperature, neutrons and protons are in term equilibrium and, uh, during to, uh, due to the weak force. So they can change into one another because of weak force. And, and, and at this temperature, at a few MeV, since the mass of the proton, the mass of the neutron, they're both around one GeV, so a thousand times larger than MeV, they're non relativistic. And if they're not relativistic, uh, but they are in equilibrium, they obey the uh, Boltzmann um, distribution. We can take the ratio of the number density of neutrons, to the number density of protons. That's just the ratio of the uh, Boltzmann factors. So the Boltzmann factor for the neutron is e to the ma minus mass of the neutron times by t. And for the proton, the same thing with the mass of the proton, okay? So the ratio of the number densities of neutrons to the number density of protons is just exponential of minus q over t, where q is the mass difference between protons and neutrons, which is actually much smaller than the mass of the mass uh, of the mass of the proton. So it, uh, the mass difference of protons and neutrons is just the 1.3 uh, MeV, which is small compared to the masses, which is around 1 G. But anyways. This is the ratio of the number density of neutrons to the number density of protons. Now, uh, the neutrons and protons, again, they exchange, uh, they can change into one another because of weak interactions. We just saw that uh, the, the weak interactions also from the neutrino calculation increases out at, uh, at the temperature of roughly 0.8 uh, MeV, one MeV. So after uh, dropping out, of, after what's called freezing out, of dropping out of equilibrium, the number density uh, remains constant because they decrease as a to the minus uh, three. And the neutral fraction at freeze out, so this is as 
capital X N F O means the neutral fra neutron fraction at result, and and this is just uh, the number of neutrons, number density of neutrons divided by the number density of neutrons plus number density of protons, and at result you can just compute this with the data I showed you. This is around one six. So well, this number is almost frozen. This ratio is frozen because they're both uh, de they're both decreasing. Both number of protons and neutrons are decreasing, but they're decreasing the same way. They decrease as a to the minus cubed. So the ratio is frozen. It's almost frozen because ne neutrons are unstable. Neutrons decay. They disintegrate. And they disintegrate for a lifetime of around 900 seconds. After this freeze out, the uh, this ratio will decrease a little bit. Uh, uh, you decrease by this factor here. Which is just the factor from uh, the decay of the neutron. Sorry, this should be tau. Uh, so this tau is the lifetime of the neutron. Now, uh, the next step is formation of helium. Uh, and helium forms due to some, these reactions here neutron plus proton giving deuterium plus photon, deuterium plus proton giving a helium three plus photon, et cetera, right? So there's a few steps. Uh, so, but, but to form helium, you have to form deuterium. That's that's uh, that's, an, that's a requirement, and the deuterium, on the other hand, uh, can, well, I also have to form helium three. But deuterium, in particular, has a very small binding energy of 0.06 uh, MeV, and uh, this happens when the universe at uh, the temperature reaches the temperature of the universe reaches 0.06 MeV when the universe was around 330 seconds. So deuterium can only form after the temperature drops below its binding energy, and that's below 0.06, so the, the time uh, should be uh, larger than 230 seconds. So just plugging in this 230 uh, here, seconds, and uh, using the neutron lifetime, so there's a, some neutrons decay during that time, you find out that the uh, ratio, this uh, fraction of neutrons, uh, is around one, one eighth. And at this point, it's a good approximation to assume that all neutrons are consumed to make helium-4. Just a crude approximation, but you find out the uh, number of of helium, that, that's fine. And it's not difficult to show, uh, just given this uh, result here, one eight, that uh, the mass fraction of helium-4 that is formed in the uh, early universe is uh, one fourth. So 25% in mass. So 20, uh, we give this symbol Y here. Uh, so this uh, this number here, 25%, uh, roughly, this is very, very roughly, um, uh, comes about just because of this physics, very, uh, very simple physics. So finding um, energy of the deuterium, uh, lifetime of the neutron, the, the, uh, the difference of masses between neutrons and protons. Very simple, okay? At least this order of magnitude is very simple. So again, the prediction of big bang nucleosynthesis is that 25% of the universe in mass is uh, made out of heat. Okay, so after the first three minutes of the universe, actually, there's a very nice book. Uh, it's already old by Steven Weinberg, novel credit, probably not Steven, uh, called The First Three Minutes. It's an outreach book, uh, which I read when I was in high school. So it's an old book. I think I was in high school, maybe I was in college. Um, so it's called the first three minutes, and that's because of this. Now, the first three minutes of the universe, uh, helium was formed, and also deuterium, very small amounts of deuterium, very small amounts of uh, lithium, and helium uh, And this was everything was formed in the first three minutes. Now, uh, the question is how do you measure uh, the, amount, the abundance of helium, for instance, or deuterium? So, those are, those are difficult measurements, okay? But they're they have been done. And these measurements, I didn't tell you that, but uh, they depend a lot on the number of baryons uh, uh, with respect to the number of photons. Okay? And so that happens in, in these calculations. You always have to consider uh, the ratio of number of baryons or number of photons, if you want, uh, divided by the number of photons. And the, uh, and the conclusion, uh, I'll show you what the measurement is. And this can be also be measured very precisely by Planck. And this is the value of Planck. So this is a number that you should keep in mind. That universe has many more uh, baryons than, uh, sorry, many more photons than baryons. It has of the order of 10 to the 10 or 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 
more photons than baryons, okay? And this is uh, something that's measured. And, and, and the abundance of helium uh, is not, it doesn't depend very much on this, but the abundance of deuterium is very sensitive to this ratio of theta here, very, very sensitive as, as I will show, okay? Actually, this number here, this 10 to the minus 10, I went too fast, but uh, ah, it's in the other slides, sorry. Yeah. And also see from the, uh, okay, if in another slide, I can show you. So the, uh, I showed the results, and these are the results that you can find in the particle data group of 2020. This has been, of course, updated every year uh, or two years. And let me, show, let me walk you through this plot. So in the, uh, um, in the horizontal axis here is the barium to photon ratio, this, this thing that I call eta. So the ratio of number of baryons, number of density of baryons, number of density of photons. And see the scale here, 10 to the minus 10 to 10 to the minus 9. You can also uh, set a bound using this on omega baryon uh, times h squared. So h squared is just the Hubble uh, constant in units of 100 uh, kilometers per second per megaparsec. And here you see that this is 10 to the minus 2. And, and, and uh, this is the 2 times 10 to the minus 2. Um, so, okay, so this is uh, 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 the results that uh, you get. And here on the uh, vertical axis are the abundances for different elements. So in the upper uh, plot here, in the upper block, the abundance of the helium-4 in mass. So this very simple calculation that we did showed that it was around 25%, 25%, one quarter. And this is the prediction, this line here, uh, Solid line is the prediction of the big bang nucleus synthesis as a function of the uh, this variant to photon uh, ratio. This is only three parameters. And the box, the yellow box, is the measure. It is a big error. It's, as I said, it's not easy to measure the uh, uh, primordial fraction of uh, of uh, of helium. Okay. Now, uh, if you go to deuterium, and things are much more interesting, uh, deuterium is very sensitive to uh, the baryon to photon ratio, this parameter eta. And if you look here, there's a very uh, thin line, the thin, uh, thin uh, box, it's supposed to be a box, yellow. So these are the measurements of, 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 uh, of uh, primordial deuterium. Okay. So it's much easier to measure the primordial deuterium than it is to measure uh, primordial helium. And this is the, actually the measurement that drives uh, the bounds from uh, Big Bang nucleus synthesis, okay? The measure of deuterium. And this is the prediction of helium-3. There's, uh, uh, there's no measurement of helium-3. Uh, don't ask me why, I don't really know. This is the measurement of uh, helium-7. So uh, I just want to draw your attention first that uh, the uh, uh, hashed uh, lines here, the blue lines are the CMB results. So this is very precise, the CMB results. And uh, oops. And the, and the purple, uh, pink, whatever, uh, uh, line here, hashed, is the uh, uh, Big Bang nucleus synthesis results, mainly from the as from, from the Ethereum, sorry. There's an amazing agreement between uh, the results from Big Bang nucleus synthesis, which is physics around 100 seconds, and the physics from the CMB, which happens at 380,000 years. <laughs> so this is just amazing, this agreement, okay? Amazing. Um, some people are uh, uh, a bit worried about the uh, fact that the lithium uh, measurement, which is the yellow box, um, does not quite uh, agree um, with this uh, prediction uh, of the uh, of, uh, that was measured uh, by CMB, for instance. But you can see that the, uh, it's a, it's a, there's a very large error in the so it wouldn't be depressed by the fact that uh, there is a, a small discrepancy here. So I would really pay attention to this incredible, ama amazing uh, agreement between uh, big bang nucleus synthesis and, uh, and cosmic microwave background measurement of the same quantity, which is eta. And by the way, this is how we know uh, this is the best measurement of omega baryons. Okay? So if you look, if you remember uh, the pi that we had there in the beginning, the first lecture, 
you know, mega barriers was around um, you know, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. This comes from this. H squared is basically one half. Okay. So this is one way of getting information about the amount of barriers. And that's independent of dark matter, by the way. Totally independent of dark matter. It depends on the uh, particles that are in uh, thermal radiation. Okay, so it's a good time to stop for questions, John. Sure, I don't see any question, but so if someone has questions. Uh, this is what I wanted to say about Big Bang movement synthesis, okay? Okay. Okay, so this is very, again, very uh, superficial, but this gives you an idea of uh, what is going on in terms of so well, now I go on and talk about the origin of baryons. Uh, there's a question from, the question is, is it model dependent? Right, so this, uh, um, uh, this is very uh, robust uh, um, measurement, um, which depends, uh, as I said, the only free parameter here is basically the number of degrees of freedom that are relativistic, so in this equation here, of number of baryons to number of folds. Of course, it depends on the number of baryons because you know these are number of protons, and these are protons are things that are making uh, uh, the helium, right? So the uh, the result on the uh, amount of protons is very robust in the universe. That's why this is amazing. So again, and and this agrees with other measurements, but peak bang synthesis is one of the uh, main things. There was also uh, this, as I said, it depends on the number of of degrees of freedom that's relativistic. So it also depends on the number of neutrinos. And, uh, and Big Bang nucleosynthesis was uh, the first uh, observation for you know, CMB, et cetera, that could give you a hint of the number of neutrinos in the universe that are true families. So this comes from Big Bang nucleosynthesis before lab. <laughs> cool. Um, there's one, another question by Ganesh, who asks uh, whether energy is conserved from one transition to the other while the universe expands. So this uh, has, sorry, so this has nothing to do with Big Bang synthesis, right? If I understand correctly. Uh, no, as far as I understand, it's about the transition from one era to the other. So from, say, radiation dominated to matter dominated, things like that. So again, yes, as, as I said before, uh, uh, energy, energy conservation is a, is a big name. <laughs> All I can tell is that the energy with tensor is conserved in general relativity and that's what we use, okay? Well, other globally, as the energy as the universe expands, it's of concern. So. Sorry, it's, it's ER, so um, at the global scale of the universe, while it's expanding, it's of a concern when a photon is right shifting, right? So, so I, yeah, again, when, okay, this is a big discussion of energy conservation in the universe. As I said before, energy is a Something in general relativity is difficult to define what energy is. Um, all, all, all I want to say is that our equations follow from uh, uh, the conservation of energy momentum tensor, which is something very so that's, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Next, Fernando Abreu is asking, why is deuterium very sensitive to the barium photon ratio? Can you repeat why is why is the deuterium so sensitive to the baryon photon ratio? Why is what why why the, baryons? The deuter deuterium. Ah, deuterium. Yes. So because deuterium has a very uh, small binding energy, so it's very easy to uh, disintegrate deuterium. So it's very sensitive to the number of photons. Actually, that's why it's very sensitive to the ratio. Okay, cool. I don't see more questions, so we'll continue. Okay, so let's move on. 
Yeah, sorry if I'm being a bit fast, but uh, I try to slow down. You have 20 minutes left. That's not much. <laughs> so uh, let me let me talk about something that's really interesting, which is the origin of bearings. Okay, so we talked about the origin of uh, a nucleus, nuclear nuclear elements, right? Nucleus uh, here. So helium four, deuterium, etc. Actually, something you may ask is, uh, how about the other heavier nuclei? How are they formed? So they are the fo they are formed in the process of uh, star formation and star uh, in the lifetime of a star. Uh, ele heavier elements are formed by nuclear reactions in stars. And stars explode. They uh, send the elements, the heavy elements. But now I want to talk about the origin of barium. So that's uh, something. Uh, and this goes under the name of baryogenesis, uh, the, the origin of baryons. And I want to start by uh, doing a very disturbing calculation for baryogenesis. I, I just want to follow exactly what we did for neutrinos, uh, for okay, and see, uh, you know, if I could, what can we say about the number density of baryons? So let's estimate uh, first of all the freeze out of baryons. Assuming a typical baryonic cross section. So, baryons they interact through strong interactions. And typically, strong interactions, you can, uh, you can say that the typical uh, strong interaction uh, is mediated by a pion at low energies. So, the typical cross section goes like one over uh, pion mass squared, because that's the, uh, that's the uh, only dimension for parameter. And the, the cross section was seven dimensions of one, en one over energy squared. And the pion mass is around 100. Energy. So you can go and, and compute the uh, uh, temperature of result just by, again, uh, combining the number density of, of baryons uh, as a function of temperature times the cross-section, a thermal average cross-section to the Hubble expansion. And something you can find that I left as an exercise, not difficult because just plug in here uh, the Boltzmann suppression factor here is a constant cross section, and here is the you know t square over m Planck kind of thing. And what you find is this: is that uh, the freeze out temperature is given by this relation here. So this is the mass of a baryon over or nucleon, if you want, over uh, the freeze out temperature. That must be around 50. And 50 comes because of this log. Okay. Okay. So why is this upsetting? <laughs> This is upsetting because of the following. Uh, because you can compute from this what is the result of eta, which is the ratio of the number of protons or baryons, if you want, to the number of photons. And if you do that, there is this, uh, as I said, the uh, exponential suppression here. And if you put uh, the, uh, sorry, should be a PF. So if you put the freeze out temperature, what you find is that eta should be 10 to the minus 19. What we just saw by that measurements gives you eta of order of 10 to the minus 9, basically. Something between 10 to the minus 10, 10 to the minus 9. Okay. So this is a very disturbing result that uh, the universe would be very, very diluted in terms of variance with focus and 10 orders of magnitude dif uh, difference. So what is wrong? What did we do that is wrong? So what we did that is wrong is that, not wrong, but <laughs> what we did is that uh, I didn't tell you that we assumed that the universe was symmetric, totally symmetric between baryons and antibaryons, protons and antiprotons. And, and what happens is that they annihilate each other like crazy when we become non-relativistic until they drop out of equilibrium. And they annihilate to the point that the only thing left is a very, very small point. It's still symmetric, okay? So this prediction is not only wrong because of 10 orders of magnitude here, but also would predict that the universe is completely symmetric between matter and dynamic. So what is the way out of this uh, um, blatant violation of uh, observations? So the most popular thing is that uh, we start with a universe that is not very symmetric. There must exist some type of mechanism to create a tiny asymmetry between matter and antimatter. 
in various and and in fact, uh, one uh, intent denying asymmetry is enough. So I borrowed this slide from uh, Hitoshi Murayama, who gave a, a very nice talk about this stuff. This is like in the early universe. We have one billion and two particles of matter and one billion particles of antimatter. And then they annihilate and only two are left. So matter won over antimatter. But how, how, how can this happen? How, how can, it's, it's a tiny asymmetry, but you need to have a mechanism to generate, right? Unless you assume that's initial conditions. That's something we usually don't like to do. We'd like to explain the origin of this uh, uh, initial asymmetry between matter and antimatter. That's very small. So how do we try, sorry. There are, there are two questions that are related to your, to your explanations now. So. The first one is, does considerations of chemical potential can solve this problem? So I'm not sure what he has in mind. Right, so the chemical, yeah, I'm not sure. I, I think, we, of course, chemical potential were, uh, was considered also, but I didn't, I don't, I probably cannot. Um, um, if, I, right, I think the chemical potential, yeah. I, actually, I don't know, but, uh, Probably people thought about this because they thought about everything. So the, the, the answer is that I, I don't know if the chemical potential, but I kind of have to assume what is the origin of the chemical potential. Next question is, all this interaction happen in a time-like domain? In a what? Time-like domain. Time-like domain. So which interactions? So this, this is all happening uh, throughout the universe and when the universe was very uh, young, you know. The freeze-out temperature, as I, as I mentioned here, compute is like uh, uh, mass of the uh, proton is at one GV divided by 50. So this is the freeze-out temperature. And this is a uh, very high temperature. So you can compute what is the redshift related to this if you want, or the time when this happens. So it's, it's in the very, uh, it's, it's, uh, um, it's earlier than a second, I don't know. Uh, please, Ganesh, uh, tell us if, if Roger really didn't answer the question and he will elaborate further. Yeah. And lastly, there's a question by Martin de Rios, who asks whether there is an upper value for the asymmetry. Upper value for the symmetry. So the asymmetry, uh, what it, Depends what you call a symmetry. So if you call a symmetry this ratio of number of variance uh, to number of photons, yes, this is this is the uh, the experimental uh, bound. This is the asymmetry because there's no. Uh, this is what you want to explain. Yeah, to measure. That answer well. It's better than another bound. Um. Ah, he says, okay. Sorry? No, I'm Ganesh is elaborating further. So he's saying, in the early universe, everything is moving at the speed of light. So it is time back. So I think well, that's what he meant by time like domain. He meant that particles were relativistic. But, uh, yeah, so the protons, when the temperature was uh, smaller than one GV, they were normal to distant. Protons and neutrons. Okay, so question answer, he says. Okay, you can continue, there are no more questions. Okay, very good. So, so we have to, you know, as I was, I was saying that one possibility, of course, is just the uh, initial condition, right? That you can have uh, this very tiny symmetry. <clears throat> um, but this is not what we'd like. Uh, usually we this is we like to have some uh, explanation for this tiny symmetry. And amazingly enough, uh, um, already in 1967, um, the uh, Soviet scientist uh, Andrei Sakharov was thinking about this. 1967, it's amazing. He was thinking why there is more matter than antimatter. And he came up with uh, three conditions that uh, theories must satisfy, satisfy in order to be able to generate the asymmetry uh, between variance and antivariance. 
So one is, uh, of course, baryon number violation. So you need a process that can change baryon number. So baryon number is not conserved. You also need uh, the violation of uh, some symmetries, uh, so charge and uh, charge conjugation and charge conjugation prior to violation. Otherwise, if you violate baryon number one way, it would come back uh, through uh, just equilibrium processes. And also, you also need to have no equilibrium processes. So uh, uh, this uh, uh, photons have to, whatever is causing this um, symmetry has to be a no equilibrium process. Otherwise you regenerate uh, the, uh, the symmetry. So these conditions were, again, uh, amazingly uh, described in 1967. And, and today, I, I think it's fair to say Maybe people will not agree with me, but uh, there is no standard model of baryogenesis. Um, Grand unified theories were, uh, in the beginning, were thought to be a possibility to explain baryogenesis because there's this grand unified gauge bosons uh, would decay and violate the uh, violate baryon number. Uh, so, grand unified theories violate baryon number. And they have proton decay, for instance. So, it was a possibility. Uh, more recently, uh, leptogenesis has, uh, has been considered as a possibility for baryon number generation. And all these conditions are, in fact, amazingly uh, enough, they're also present in the standard model. So uh, even though the standard model uh, uh, perturbatively does not violate baryon number, as uh, I mentioned, at the non perturbative level, it can violate the baryon number. This is a very tiny rate. But in the early universe, uh, this may become uh, uh, sizable. Now, the thing also uh, is that, uh, so this, these are things that can generate by a number of violations. You also need the violation of CNCP. And uh, uh, in the standard model, the, uh, um, and, uh, the amount of CP violations is not enough to uh, generate uh, the asymmetry that is needed for. And this is this has motivated searches for new sources of CP violation, uh, for instance, at the LHCb or neutrino sector. If you talk about leptogenesis, and in my opinion, uh, again, the jury is still out on um, what is the uh, um, best model to describe baryogenesis. Certainly, no one. There's no standard model, and it has not. All the models are still uh, being proposed and, and have. So uh, this is what I want to say about the origin of uh, baryon or matter antimatter symmetry. Uh, it's, it's still an open question in physics. It's an observation, and it's still an open question. Any questions, John? Um, There's a question I was elaborating from uh, the chemical potential from before. So Sudip the show is asking, if we are not considering chemical potential, then how the number density will differ for particle and antiparticle, and how a symmetry will be generated? Right. So the chemical potential has to do with the symmetry as well, I think. Photons, for instance, have no chemical potential because they have no open particles. So again, the issue of, uh, of generating the asymmetry, uh, what you need is this uh, uh, Sakharov's condition. Um, um, I'm, again, I'm not uh, sure what is the role of chemical potential in this. I have to check. But if you want to generate the asymmetry from first principles, you need to have these three conditions. Next question is, can you repeat the explanation for Sakharov criteria? Yes. So first, you need uh, you need to have a process in which bio number is not conserved, and that's because you need to generate bio number, right? Uh, so this is the first thing, and then uh, you have to be able to differentiate between matter and antimatter, and that comes with a charge conjugation uh, violation. So there is not a, there is an asymmetry between matter and it behaves differently. And third of all, you have to have processes that are not in thermal equilibrium. Otherwise, if they're thermal equilibrium, things that go in one way goes back and you will erase any uh, baryon symmetry that was generated. So th th that's the motivation for the three second of 
Cool. No, no more questions. Ah, there's one more question. Uh, more there question? are two more questions, and there are five minutes left. What do you want to do? Answer questioning questions now, uh, or let's... continue with your explanation, and then we we'll leave the questions for the Q and A. No, wait. I have no. I have twenty minutes, right? Ah, you're right. Uh, one second. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. It, it finishes at uh, fifteen, no? Yeah. Quarter past. Sure, sure, sure. You have twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. What, okay. So I, I, I pass you the questions then, no? Okay. So, Alessia is asking, in which way neutrinos, CV violation, can affect the variogenesis? The recent measurement of an almost maximal CV violation in oscillation, can at least partially solve this problem? Right. So, uh, neutrinos, of course, you can think that neutrinos are unrelated to bearings, and you're correct. However, in the standard model, again, there are no perturbative processes that can uh, relate neutrinos to bearings. And these are called uh, um, spalarum processes, for instance. And um, so there is a way to relate uh, um, uh, conic number to baryon number. Uh, okay, they're related. So that's how, um, if, you, if, you, if you can somehow uh, produce a, uh, a symmetry between in the, lep in the leptonic sector that can be transferred to the uh, to the baryonic sector. That depends, of course, on the details of the uh, of the lepton sector and CP violation. And I think that the, the CP violation, the standard model that has been measured so far, um, it's not enough. The next question is, how can leptogenesis be related to baryon number violation, which you partially, Sorry? partially The next question yeah. is, how can leptogenesis be related to baryon number violation, yeah. which you partially yeah. right. addressed? I don't know if uh, Andrea was probably going to have not said anything. But, uh, so again, uh, there are process, non perturbative processes in the standard model uh, that can uh, um, transform lepton number to baryon number. Okay, next question is the last one, it seems. It says, is the analysis of the variogenesis are going to, so I read literally what is written and then I interpret it. Is the analysis of the variogenesis are going to fulfill incubated space time effects considered? Or the prediction just consider standard quantum field theory in Minkowski? For instance, it is common in quantum field theory incubated space times that, for example, a black hole emits particles, more particles than antiparticles in Hawking radiation. This is something, again, uh, that we're thinking about in the, in the, more, the average universe, right? things that are occurring in this plasma. So not, not in, for instance, black holes are not, of course, black holes, unless they're primordial black holes, but uh, this is another issue. Um, but th this is, again, this is uh, under the assumption that we want to generate and uh, this asymmetry with this uh, physics that we know in the, uh, uh, in the uh, hot and dense uh, plasma of the early universe without considering black holes. So, so right, so this is uh, the background geometry that uh, we are talking about, Freeman Robertson Walker. Cool. Uh, ah, one, one last question. Is variogenesis restricted by proton decay in guts? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the uh, yeah, you need that process, but you need baryon number violation. And uh, but I think that was not the main problem. Uh, why guts? Um, I'm trying to remember. Well, one thing that happened is that the, the simplest model of guts, uh, the Nernicke theory, was ruled out. Basically, people did not find uh, uh, proton decay. So that has an impact, yes. So you need to have uh, the right, the correct rate of uh, baryon number violation. So, so uh, it's, of course, if you don't measure proton decay, or then, then uh, granified theories, at least the simplest ones can be.
Uh, there are no more questions. Okay, so let's continue. And the, the thing I was sorry. Uh, no, I just was I was just reminding you that there are 15 minutes left. So I'm not going to talk about dark matter <laughs> because you have that next week. And so I go very briefly, because we already talked about this, uh, origins of atoms and the CMD. Again, as the universe cools down, electrons and protons, and they became bound and form electrically neutral atoms. And this is the recombination we just talked about. And that happens when the universe was around 280,000 uh, years after the Big Bang and a redshift of uh, 1100. So this is... Um, so this happens uh, after uh, equality between matter and radiation. So this is a redshift that's smaller than 2,500 with something that computed. And I just want to mention that, of course, you probably know this, but uh, the, uh, this was the origin of the cosmic microwave background. The cosmic microwave background was predicted uh, first, uh, I think, by Gamov again in, in collaborators in the late 1940s, but this work was Basically forgotten, and uh, and then there was a group in Princeton, and that uh, was um, predicted and was looking for it. Um, Peebles is one of the persons involved in Princeton, and then there was a group of radio astronomers that were uh, looking for um, effects of uh, radio wave transmissions, and they found this is the antenna they were using, and they found a, a noise in this uh, antenna that they couldn't. He tried everything to get rid of this uh, funny noise that came from all directions of space and they couldn't find a reason. <laughs> and when the people at Princeton heard about the, what these guys were uh, finding in their antenna, uh, they told them that they found the cosmic white micro. So this was 1965 and this, uh, uh, as you know, Luson and Pensius, they got the Nobel Prize in 1978. And uh, we are going to talk a little bit more about the uh, satellites that measure this uh, cosmic uh, micro background from Kobe to Planck. Actually, Planck stopped in 2015. And uh, the latest results are from 2018, which I'm going to talk about. So the cosmic micro background is the uh, most perfect black body spectrum ever. <laughs> so this is the uh, uh, data from Kobe. And uh, because it had the height of the right instrument, and you can see that the temperature is very well determined. And now, uh, in the last uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, I want to talk about the origin of the homogeneities. Uh, so, this is something interesting. First of all, we know that uh, the CMB uh, uh, was originated in this uh, last scattering surface around 1100. I think I repeated this a couple of times already. And after, after that, the universe became transparent to radiation. And, and, um, and the thing is that uh, in the CMB is extremely homogeneous. Uh, so um, uh, the first measurements, of course, didn't see any uh, departure from homogeneity in the CMB. But COBE, the satellite COBE, is the first satellite to find that uh, there are small perturbations, uh, small deviations of uh, homogeneity, so in small inhomogeneities in the cosmic microwave background. Despite of being very uniform over the whole sky, there are very small variations of uh, order of one part in, in uh, 100,000. And this is very important. Uh, I just want to point out that if the universe at uh, say at the, the CMB time was completely homogeneous, completely homogeneous, we will not be here because we are a consequence of the evolution of this very, very tiny inhomogeneities uh, in the early universe. Very tiny inhomogeneities, they, uh, it, they, uh, they grew over time and they formed, you know, galaxies and uh, eventually form planets and us. So we are part of this very, very tiny uh, fluctuations in the past, okay? So it's important. And uh, in, the, in fact, people uh, predicted already that there should be some uh, inhomogeneities. And Peebles, uh, in the cosmic microwave background, I think Peebles was one of the persons that uh, 
And that's one of the reasons he uh, got the Nobel Prize. But then, uh, because of this uh, um, in, in homogeneities, um, very, very small in, in homogeneities, meaning that the universe was extremely homogeneous, um, uh, one can think of why, um, why, uh, why, do you, why the CMB is so homogeneous, right? This is the causality problem, or the causality problem. And the causality problem, I just show in this very qualitative and simple figure as follows. This should be 1100. What's going gone? Don't you do? I'm trying to correct my slide. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, do this. For some reason, in this font, I cannot. So this should be a Z over 11. So this plot shows the fault. First of all, this is like, a, this is conformal time. So light goes in 45 degrees. This is space. This is Big Bang. So Z equals infinity. And you have a light rays that goes from infinity to the uh, last scattering surface. So these two points here in the last scattering surface, I don't know if you can see my, you can see my uh, pointer, right? Can you see my pointer, John? Uh, yes. Yeah. So, so you have uh, this, uh, this region here. So this is around the coupling time. So when the uh, microwave radiation uh, is generated, microwave background radiation. And you can see that there is a finite uh, uh, horizon here at, at, the, uh, at the last scattering surface. So, um, uh, points that uh, were in the last scattering surface and were separated by an uh, angle that we see today, larger than the angle subtended by a horizon here, should, didn't have time to be in contact, in causal contact. So the big puzzle in the cosmic microwave background is why it is so uniform. If you take these regions here, uh, which have not had time to be in causal contact, how come? They have the same temperature, so very, very large precision. So this is the causality problem of the CMB. So the light from the last scattering surface reaches us from causally disconnected regions. So these regions, these two regions here, you see these two regions? They are totally uh, disconnected causally because they didn't have time to be uh, connected. And, and, and so the question is, how can they have the same temperature? And if you ask, what is the uh, angular size of a uh, horizon uh, at this uh, the coupling that seen to us today uh, by an angular uh, diameter distance, this is, uh, you can make this calculation very simple. It's one degree in the sky. So re uh, regions that are separated by angles today larger than one degree, we're not in causal contact at the cup. How come they have the same temperature, right? The sky there all comes from the very, very similar temperatures, very, very uniform. So that was one of the main motivations for inflation. So inflation uh, is, in a, is a period of very fast uh, expansion of the universe. And a single small patch can fill the whole uh, horizon at the cup. So uh, what happens is, oh, no, I don't have the picture. What happens during inflation, you can imagine that these lines here that are straight, uh, curved, oops, and they just uh, fill out the whole uh, Z equals 1100 uh, surface. What happens to inflation? Or you can think inflation as putting this, uh, this line here way, way back. That's another way of thinking of it. So inflation is this very, very fast period of exponential expansion of the number. And the idea is that this very a single small region can expand exponentially and fill the whole horizon at the couple. So that uh, uh, explains the causality problem because everything was uh, was it was coming from one single uh, region that was in thermal contact, was in causal contact. And also one of the consequences of inflation it also predicts that the universe is spatially flat as observed, as I mentioned before. 
any sign of a curvature would be erased just by this very, very rapid uh, uh, exponential uh, expansion. And also something I will just uh, flash is that inflation also provides these very small quantum fluctuations that are the seeds for the inhomogeneities that we observe. Inflation uh, is a model that can explain several things. It can, it can solve the causality problem. It can explain why the universe is observed as, as being spatially flat. And it can generate the seeds for these uh, perturbations, for these inhomogeneities that uh, we see. So what is the basic idea uh, behind inflation? So the basic idea uh, you probably uh, can imagine is that the very, the very early universe dominated by the energy density of a surprise scalar field. And this is the basic idea, the other things, but this is the most, the simplest possible thing. And this scalar field we call the inflow. Scalar field is slowly rolling down potential like so. And when it's, rolling, it's slowly rolling down the potential, it means that the kinetic energy is much smaller compared to the potential energy. And as we saw in this uh, in the second lecture, that means that the uh, scale factor grows exponentially, right? So this is the origin of inflation. And then at some point, the uh, field starts to roll faster and inflation ends. And then there is a region here I call, I explain later, which we call reheat, where the universe uh, reheats and comes back to the usual Friedman, uh, Friedman field. So this was the basic picture. And this is, uh, I just, uh, I couldn't resist to take this uh, index from one review of inflation. And the review is called the Encyclopedia Inflation Harris. Uh, and you can count here, you know, 50 different models for inflation. So there are many, many different models uh, uh, for inflation. And one question you can ask and you should ask is whether we can test these models. And the answer is uh, yes, yes, we can, yes, we can. So first, I will discuss a little bit about how inflation ends. Uh, so the uh, so the field here, after after rolling down the potential, enters in this uh, uh, at the minimum of the potential, uh, and it, then it can oscillate here. And when the scalar field oscillates, one can show that it behaves as a gas of non-relativistic particles. Not difficult to show that. So the inflat, there's a lot of uh, inflaton particles, so those are the inflaton particles, and the inflaton decays, and, and then uh, the inflaton particle decays. And, then, and that's what causes the reheat of the universe, as in the case in relativistic particles. So this is what I wrote here, that the oscillating field around the minimum of the potential produces what is called the reheating of the universe. You can show that the oscillating scalar field is equivalent to a gas of particles, and we can also estimate the mass of these particles like 10 to the 12 GV, and they can decay to radiation, that's model effect, okay? But in reality, uh, the reheating process is more complicated because there's something called reheating, possibility of reheating, et cetera. So there are more complicated things that can happen. And then you may ask yourself, okay, so the universe reheats, so what's the temperature after the universe reheats? What is the bound? So the actually, actually the only bound one can have on the reheating temperature uh, is that it must be larger than the temperatures required for PK nucleosynthesis. So this is as low as one uh, GeV. So I stop here, and in the next lecture I will uh, come back to uh, inflation and discuss a little bit more uh, uh, what are the uh, observables and how we can place bounds or even eliminate some of the models of inflation. So let's stop here, John. Good okay. Thank you very much, Rogerio. So there are three questions. The first one by David, which says, is because they started with the same initial condition, a different answer for the causality problem? Um, so the causality problem has to do with the fact that the universe is extremely homogeneous. It's not because of the homogeneity, it's in homogeneity, it's because of the homogeneity. And there's no uh, reason why 
regions that are totally that are causal, causally disconnected, causally, causally disconnected. There's no reason why they should have the same properties, they have same temperature, same temperature, for instance. So it's not an issue of initial conditions here. It's really an, an issue of causality. I mean, if you want to accept it as an initial condition, if I may add, then, I mean, people don't accept that solution because it will require an extreme fine tuning. Yeah. Uh, the next question is, um, during inflation, the space expanded at the speed greater than speed of light. Yeah, so you have super luminal expansion of the universe. That's not a problem, that doesn't give you any problem with uh, causality because information cannot travel faster uh, than light. But uh, the universe, so, so the universe can expand faster than light, but information cannot travel faster. So you don't get into trouble with causality. Why inflation shows cosmological constant type behavior, even though it is driven by a scalar field? Yes. So this is um, something um, from last lecture when we talked about dark uh, energy. So every time, I don't know if you remember, um, but the equation of state for a scalar field which is the ratio of pressure to energy density, given by kinetic energy minus potential energy divided by kinetic energy plus potential energy. Now, if the potential energy dominates over kinetic energy, this goes to minus one, this ratio. Minus one is the equation of state of, uh, of a cosmological constant. That what causes the expansion of the universe. So in, in a sense, the inflaton field in the beginning of the universe behaves like dark energy because uh, it's also a situation where the potential energy is much, much larger than the kinetic energy. So the equation of state is very close to minus one. The difference is that you end this phase by uh, the field coming back here. And uh, actually here you already end because the kinetic energy becomes comparable to the potential energy. and uh, and you have, uh, so you don't have inflation anymore, and that's why the inflation ends around here. Cool. So the next question is, are there other solutions to solve the causality problem? To solve what? The causality problem. The causality problem, in addition to inflation. Uh, so inflation is the uh, standard uh, accepted model, but there, I think there are alternative models I'm not very familiar with. There's something called the equipiroptic model where you have brains colliding and somehow this can produce uh, the photons, etc., without violating causality. But uh, as far as I know, um, the most natural, uh, not model, but class of uh, models is, uh, is inflation. I, maybe Joan wants to, or someone else wants to comment, but uh, um, there, were, there was some issue some time ago, some, not some time ago, in that inflation is not a, it's not a model or cannot be totally tested. I tend to disagree with that. Yeah, I would say that, I mean, I, I'm not aware about other alternatives because all these other alternatives are elaborations to the basic fact that point in the future had to be in causal contact before, which is what the incentive inflation is doing. So all these other models have further structure, but they also do that. I'm not aware of other solutions. I'm putting point in causal contact. <laughs> it is by yeah. the inflation. That's, yeah. Funny because uh, just, just, uh, there was a, some people like led by Paul Steinhardt uh, wrote something yeah. like a manifesto and uh, and then other people wrote a counter manifesto. But um, I don't, my opinion is that uh, I, I don't know, I'm not, as, as Ron said, I'm not aware of any model that can explain the causality uh, issue uh, in, a, in a way just like inflation. I mean, in a way it is essentially different than 
having an inflation period. Um, then the next question is, can the vacuum state be unstable? If so, what would be the consequences? Let's, this question maybe it's better for the lecture of Andrea, but yeah. should we save it or? Yeah, save it for the discussions. Okay. So they didn't, so why don't we save the, the next two questions for, for the discussion? The next question is, bouncing cosmology is one of the alternatives to inflation. Ah, this is another question, this is a statement, okay. So there is, this question, there is only this question left about the unstable vacuum. We can leave it for the discussion sessions because we are already five minutes left and then we can meet again. Um, so I don't remember, one hour and 40? Yes. The schedule, one hour and 40, right? Yes. Okay. So okay. thanks a lot, Rogerio, again for the lecture. Thank you very much. See you. See you later. So all the questions, we, that I see that there are more questions. We will address them later. Please uh, remember them.